Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to the Yale School of Management virtual LGBTQ plus admissions panel. Uh, my name is Jordan Brooks and I use the pronouns he, him. I'm not an assistant director for community inclusion at SOM. Um, as a department, we're kind of uniquely positioned within the school since we have the privilege to engage with students throughout their journey from prospective student all the way through enrollment and even once they become alums um, with us, our engagement with alums as far as recruiting is concerned and just further engagement with current students. Um, our focus as a, as a department is really to, um, to focus on historically marginalized groups and seek to increase the representation across the, the full scope of diversity. Um, so I'm pleased really to offer you some of our great students who are, who are happily joined us today about this with this conversation about their journey and experience as a student um, and their journey into MBA. I'll just let you all know once we start, feel free to send your questions over through the chat function. Um, we want to be sure we get the answers, the questions answered that are most relevant to you um, and make the, really the most of our time together. Um, and even after the, the panel, please, we encourage you to remain engaged with us as a community and we're happy to continue to support you through your journey um, into MBA. So I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, let's start with, with Jerry. All right, I, it took a little time for me to unmute myself. Sorry, y'all. Um, my name is Jerry Lambronados. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. And uh, I'm a second year uh, MBA or here at SOM. I came from the field of education, um, war, was initially a teacher uh, early in my career, but then uh, worked in administration and human capital type work. Um, and I'm gonna be pivoting into the world of management consulting right after graduating. Should I popcorn it off, Jordan? I'm yeah, gonna do it. <laughs> Martha, it's on you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, my name is Martha. I use they, them pronouns. I am from Massachusetts. Prior to SOM, I was teaching acting at UMass Amherst. Um, I'd gotten my MFA in acting, and for that I'd uh, worked as a freelance writer. Um, now I'm pivoting to marketing. I was at PepsiCo in brand management over the summer where I will be returning after I finish my second year. Um, so yeah, David, over to you. Sure. Hi everyone, my name is David Artiaga Caicedo. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, prior to SOM, I lived in New York City where I worked in finance, sales and trading specifically. And I'm in my second year now and will be pivoting into management consulting post-graduation. Um, in addition to just being um, identified as a, as a gay man, um, I'm also a Latino. And so I've also worked with uh, MLT, if anyone has any questions about that and intersectionality there. But that's a little bit about me. And so Sherry, if you'd like to go next. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm Sherry, I use she, her pronouns. I'm from East Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, prior to SOM, I was working in healthcare. So I was most recently in Boston uh, doing corporate strategy at a um, behavioral health managed care company. And I'm hoping to stay within healthcare after my MBA, um, but looking to pivot more into the healthcare provider space or into a healthcare delivery organization. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So we're just gonna get started with the questions from and from the group. Um, I'll encourage everyone still to please send in your questions via the chat um, so we can make sure we get to the questions that you want to an get answered. Um, so first question that we have is, why did you choose Yale? Um, I can start that one. Um, I'll give a partial answer because I'm sure other people will give other aspects of my answer later. Um, so for me, I am coming from the arts and higher ed, so I'm a very non-traditional MBA, and I think that SOM's reputation as um, a school that is not only welcoming to, but supportive of non-traditional MBA candidates was really important to me, as well as the sense that Yale SOM is more integrated into the broader university than I think other business schools are. I'll, I'll stop there. I can go next. Um, I'll also give a partial answer uh, just to give some space for my fellow panelists. But for me, a big piece of it was a community. Um, I would say as you go through the MBA process, you'll start to notice that different schools have different personalities. And for me, I just really aligned with the personality that I saw at SOM. It was one that was very supportive despite 
um, any prior connection and I can give some anecdotes. So when I was applying to SOM, I reached out to a number of current students and alum to just assist me with my application. And once I even got offered an interview to assist me with interview prep and every single individual that I reached out to, despite not knowing me at all, um, assisted me and it, it resulted in like five mock interviews and just multiple people reading over my application essays. And for me, that was just really reflective of the type of environment that I wanted to be a part of. And glad to say that once I joined campus, it was very much true to see that this support was reflective not only in my own class, but in the second years as well. I feel like I'd be repeating things. So I'm just gonna ditto what David just said through and through. Um, and only thing I would add is the way that I experienced that, that that also was I, the, what I felt coming in being like, oh, it just feels so supportive here. And I felt that during consulting recruiting, which is arduous and grueling and to have people by your side, not like elbowing you to get to the front, but really people who like want to see you succeed, it mean, means the world and makes such a big difference for you because, you know, it's going to be hard. You're going to need people by your side. Yeah, I'll round it out here and say um, plus one to everything. Definitely. Um, when I went to admissions events, I it felt like I could resonate with a lot of the um, current students or alumni panelists that I had interacted with um, who were from Yale SOM. Um, and I would also say that um, the, the mission, right, the business and society piece is a huge draw. And I think that's partly what draws so many people from non-traditional backgrounds to the school um, and brings that re like really enriching environment. Um, and yeah. Of course, other business schools like have that aspect as well, but I think um, Yale really tries to emphasize that and you know, I, getting a sense of it in my first semester. Perfect, so thank you all. So we have a bunch of questions about out of office. Can you speak to your experience with the club and some initiatives that out of office has? Sure. Um, so I can just start off and, and um, I'm sure Martha will have other thoughts as well, but um, I can briefly talk about first year. So first year was was really great. So um, fortunately, myself and Martha were a part of the first year leadership team, um, along with a, a third counterpart, Danny Hurwitz. And the three of us had a great time working together, some new initiatives that came forth. Um, so our fellow leader, Danny, led uh, the Affinity Week during the first fall semester, which we're still trying to navigate what's gonna, what it's gonna look like this year, um, but basically it, it was a, um, a week long filled with events. So the, we had coming out monologues where we had individuals partake and share their story of coming out um, and just to the broader SOM community to really invite individuals into you know, what, it's, it's, what it's like and our own experiences, invite them into our community from that perspective. Um, in the spring semester of last year, we had some initiatives with trying to integrate individuals that belong to the community outside of SOM. So we had a grad mixer from different schools come together in a space, which again, we're gonna to try to see how we can make that work this year um, virtually. Um, and so that was really nice to see that, to see the broader Yale community really come together um, and see just how um, we could all just work and just try to make this community stronger um, for everyone. Yeah, so I would say that the ways that out, so out of office functions sort of internally in a community building sense and also to help LGBTQ MBA students with recruiting, etc. And then their sort of outward facing work is, you know, education and advocacy internal to SOM and then doing admission stuff like this. And, you know, we tend to um, field a lot of questions from LGBTQ perspectives, et cetera. Um, so just speaking to the more internal elements, I think for me, um, having the community of out of office has been really, really important. Um, this is not unique to SOM, but I wouldn't say, I, I would say that the MBA world generally is a very cis heteronormative space and having a queer community is invaluable. 
Um, I would also say that from a recruiting perspective, um, I highly recommend wherever you end up for your MBA, definitely attend the Ramba conference. It's Reaching Out MBA. It's the, if you haven't heard of it, it's the LGBTQ MBA conference. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to build community and network within you know, current LGBTQ MBAs, um, as well as network and recruit with um, companies that are seeking to hire queer and trans talent. So I yeah, highly recommend that. It's a really great opportunity. And also just you know, making friends you know, watching drag shows together or whatever, you know, having your, having your queer people. Yeah, I'll just... That's the point about Ram, oh, sorry, Siri. I'm just gonna plug Reaching Out MBA really quick. They have, they actually, their, their event is happening right now. Um, they had their um, kickoff last week or throughout this week, and they're also gonna have another MBA session this weekend that Yale's gonna be a part of. So if anybody is interested in Reaching Out MBA, feel free to go to their website. Um, Yale's a big, um, participant within that organization and we're happy to support you and meet you there as well so um, I'll be there we were there last week and we had a good time so feel free to join us in that space as well go ahead sure yeah I was just gonna um, say that you know um, as a first year the like first real really welcoming community was out of office um, can you hear me okay oh yeah and, and, you know, it as an informal, like social space, um, I've just found it to be so incredibly wonderful um, uh, within, you know, the first years and then more broadly, um, the community that the second years have, have created for us. We got a question about out of office and external organizations that you work with. So does out of office use any or part, partner with any external orgs to do events or fundraising at all? Um, well, so I will say, um, so we're still trying to again, navigate what uh, external partnerships look like in, in this COVID world. But so we did, um, there was a consulting firm that did partner with us and give us money. Um, and so basically what that looks like is companies coming with us to help, you know, uplift out of office with, you know, with funds to uh, have events and just um, have more exposure into the students. And so even though we can't have events, what we've seen happen is different companies come to us via uh, the CDO um, and give us LGBTQ spe um, specific events, uh, be it an opportunity such as a fellowship or perhaps a roundtable or maybe even just pre-recruiting opportunities for individuals that identify as part of the community. Um, so I would say that's an example of how external um, organizations work with out of office. We have a question about New Haven in general. So how's life in New Haven? What, what's the, the social life like? How, how was your transition from where you came from so to now um, living in New Haven, being an MBA student? So you heard earlier that I come from the city of Chicago, which I consider to be a true city. And um, New Haven is a smaller city. Um, dare I say it's a bit of a town. Uh, but I, I intentionally chose uh, Yale for that reason. That was one of the reasons. Um, I think that living in New Haven, um, given that it is not you know, a bustling city like a New York City or what have you, um, kind of pushes you to look inward um, and to form really deep connections with your classmates. Um, I can tell you that I've um, spent a bit of time with with David over the past you know a few months, probably more than he wants to to spend time with me. And um, you know you just form really deep relationships with people within your own community. Um, and with your other classmates. And I think there's nothing better than that. You're spending two years here. Like, yes, you could obviously go out on the town every night, but I think it's, it's really about the people. Um, now, just to be clear, that doesn't mean there's nothing here. Um, I actually love living here. Um, I have exactly what I need. I like the restaurant selections we have. That's really what's important to me. We have a great wine shop, which is important to me. Um, we're two hours away from New York City. If you need to scratch that itch, I know COVID times, but like back in the day, that's something that you could do. And it's centrally located on the East Coast. And I've done a lot of trips over the over the summer and David can speak to those as well. So for me, New Haven is kind of clutch and perfect. 
Um, you will find it to be a little challenging to get some groceries if you don't have a car though. So let's just be real about that. But otherwise, I really enjoy New Haven and that's my personal perspective as somebody coming from Chicago. And pro tip, just find someone with a car. I don't have a license or a car, but I've managed to just hop along rides like your groceries, so it's been great. Um, and I'll just add to that. So I was choosing between, um, it came down to SOM and Stern for me. And I'd lived in New York for like six years. I love New York. Um, but I was talking to the people at Stern and my impression was that since it is in such a big city, people have their own lives. There's so much going on all around you that there's not the same opportunity to forge a community. Um, I actually really like New Haven. Um, I actually, I think they're not at SOM, but I think there's a, a fairly visible queer community, certainly in Yale more broadly and the Yale grad and professional students. Um, so you can certainly find those people. I saw somebody ask if it was integrated into the New Haven LGBT community. You can certainly like make those connections and you know find ways to um, you know link up out of office with other organizations. Um, but yeah, so I think I think New Haven's a great place to be for a couple of years. And again, because it isn't the biggest city in the world, people spend more time together. We and, have a question, uh, Connor. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I like ahead, to um, yeah, and I, I mean, especially for for me who and, and my classmates, we are coming in in this COVID time. So imagining trying to do class in a bigger city um, where you can't go to class, you can only be virtual. Uh, Yale's been like very pretty, pretty good about um, making sure that we first years have been able to do a hybrid model. So I go into class. Monday, Tuesdays. Um, I have other classmates who go in Wednesday, Thursdays. And um, I think that speaks to the broader, you know, and administrative faculty staff effort to really prioritize the student experience. Um, so I'll just kind of plug that too. I'm not sure that that could be um, done so easily in a, in a place like New York City. Thank you all. Now, Martha, you spoke to this a little bit earlier as far as being a non-traditional applicant. Um, can you provide any more insight or tips or anyone else um, on the panel as well, if you have tips for non-traditional applicants? Yeah, Jordan, you mean like just in terms of how to frame your story for applications? How to, yeah, how to, how to approach the application, how to, how to create that narrative um, and put yeah. their best foot forward as far as the admissions committee is concerned. For sure. So um, I was lucky that I had some friends who had done MBAs before. They weren't coming from as non-traditional a background as I was, but they were able to sort of steep me in the language that I needed to frame my story and sort of highlight leadership. I mean, I, I don't mean to do scare quotes. I mean, there was actually leadership involved, but I was teaching acting. And so a lot of the work that I was doing was sort of like interpersonal um, acumen. And, you know, I was doing a lot of committee stuff with, you know, faculty committees. So I had to do a lot of work in terms of translating that background into language that was legible to like the business space. And so I would say like, reach out to other non-traditional MBAs, just work on your story because you can frame it in a way that makes your experience relevant. It just takes a little more doing for some people, myself included. I also had to do this when I was applying to jobs because, you know, I don't have a background in data analysis. Like I had to, I had to work to come up with stories that showed times that I, you know, used data to make a decision. Um, and they were all true, but they just weren't as obvious on the surface. I, I, Jordan, does that answer your question? It's really about like framing and storytelling, basically. It does. I, I, I think that's pretty good advice as far as how to frame an application. Um, I think there's a ton of questions around, you know, people not being non-traditional. I think it's very common as well to come up um, when we're doing these types of events or speaking, meeting with prospective students one-on-one. -on -one. So any, any way to kind of get, gain a competitive edge and what you shared was perfect for, for that context um, for those who are coming from non-traditional backgrounds. Um, Next Jordan, question is around. Sure. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm happy to also just chime in on there because I'd consider myself pretty non traditional coming from the. But um, the only thing that I would. Oh, did I freeze? I hope I didn't. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. 
Um, the only thing that I would uh, add to what Martha said um, is as follows. I, I, this sounds like very generic feedback, but it was actually something that was super helpful to me as I talked to somebody who was like a late career professional who did an MBA back in the day. And I was like, you know, like feed me the wisdom. And she said, um, she was like, you know, work what you got. Like, yes, you can like come into this thinking like, I don't have all those other things. Like, why are they gonna want me? And so be very clear about like what you're bringing to the table, take the time to really like write it down on paper uh, and understand why it's gonna be of value to the program. And to really understand how it's gonna be value to the program and to you, I'd say like talk to as many people as you can, just as Martha said, so that you understand like what's missing at most MBA schools. Like why would my perspective and my experience actually be um, useful here? Um, and I think like that will help you with that storytelling, with crafting like what's what's actually going on here. And it's not even a story, it's like the truth, right? It's your story. Thanks, Siri. Now, can we speak to the confidentiality of out of office club membership? There's que there are questions around, um, you know, being open or being gay in a in their home country, being legally punishable, and they don't be their participants who don't want their friends or family or anyone in their country to know that they're a part of an LGBTQ club. So, what advice would you give for a person that has that concern? Um, I'm happy. I can start to answer this one unless somebody else wants to field it. Um, so out of office membership is, um, private. You can join the club. The list is not visible to the community broadly, the SOM community broadly, or especially beyond SOM. Um, obviously there are events like participating. There are open events at SOM, like in the past coming out monologues that anybody can attend. Granted, anybody can attend it. So the fact that you're attending it doesn't necessarily like mark you as LGBTQ, but there are different levels of involvement. So you can scale your engagement based on what feels safe for you. Um, and while I can't, you know, speak to everybody, everybody that I've met would be really receptive and understanding to that kind of information and would uh, respect your privacy and confidentiality. Um, and I think that, you know, those stories are really powerful because um, it it takes a lot of strength to be out in any way if, if that's your situation. So, you know, props to you all. I might just add as someone who um, I'd say I'm, I'm recently out um, uh, like within the last year, um, but I've, I've gotten to know other classmates, uh, both international and not who are either not out or not very out. Um, it is like to, to underscore what Martha just said around like people are pretty really conscious here around like we we all live this so we know it and we're really conscious around like um not outing each other it's not our business to do that um and so i want to make sure that that's known um not only that we're really supportive uh and always around to chat with each other um about where we're at in our own journey i think that the other thing to, to, to underscore as well that Martha said is that our events are, um, our events and our club is intended to be for people who identify as LGBT, uh, LGBTQ plus as well as allies. So if you're ever thinking like, I have to be really cautious about things because I'm not fully out yet or whatever it might be, um, just understand that like our, our space is open to both folks who identify and those who are our closest allies. Wait, Jerry, to clarify, are you talking about out of office generally? Our, I was talking about our events. Oh, okay. Because I, I, I think there are different kinds of events and some are open to all yeah. of SOM and some are not. They are, they are open to anybody who identifies as LGBTQIA+. Yes, sorry, I should have been far more careful with that. There are specific events that are designated um, that are more open to our community and others that um, for reasons as we've shared before are less. 
Thank you for that. Um, so there's a ton of questions about the local community. So what opportunities do you have to engage with the New Haven community? Um, I can take that. So there are a number. Um, so I guess I'll think about this from maybe like just New Haven generally, and then just maybe like LGBTQ plus specific. Um, so generally, I would say there are a number of programs on campus. Uh, there is like social impact consulting where you consult a, an organization um, for a whole semester. There is nonprofit board fellows where you apply and then you essentially become a board member for a, um, a nonprofit um, for a year and a half. Uh, and so these uh, nonprofit board fellows is actually something I'm a part of right now. And for me, it's been very rewarding just to be, um, to have a seat at a the table where decisions are being made. Um, it's an organization that's uh, aimed at improving literacy in the community and just seeing how they made a strong pivot from having to accommodate just COVID um, you know, restrictions before they were in-person tutoring services and now everything's virtual and just being able to see the, the real impact that's being done and just made and really um, the persistence and perseverance of individuals trying to really make sure that the, the positive impact that they're having on the community is being sustained. That's one. And then separately, um, there's also the LGBTQ Resources uh, Center at Yale at large. And so this is a way to just become involved with um, the LGBTQ plus community at broader Yale. Um, they have some really neat programs that um, I participated in, one of which is a mentorship program. So this is a program where people from graduate schools can become a mentor to an undergraduate um, student. And so that has been very rewarding as well. Um, there are a number of other things, but I'll um, leave it to any other panelists if they want to talk about their experience as well. So we had some questions come through about recruiting. Can you talk to us about the, the resources that you have within SOM when it comes to recruiting for internships or even full-time offers? And then speak to your experience um, uh, as an LGBTQ plus um, ident somebody who identifies as LGBTQ plus, how that experience has been with you in recruiting? Sure. Um, there are a variety of resources, um, both that are specific to the LGBTQ uh, plus community, but also to students at large. Um, you probably heard of one before, but I think it's a big one as it made a big difference for me um, when I engaged in it last year, and that was Ramba. Uh, fun fact, I don't think anyone said this, but I, I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, y'all, um, it was actually created by a yellow SOM alum back in the day. Um, and um, it is an important, I would say, networking opportunity and learning opportunity for um, folks in our community to really like um, get access to, to jobs and and important people that will help you kind of network and, and find your way to like a, a job that makes the most sense for you. Apart from that, I can only speak to the consulting world. So just know that this is a limited perspective. Um, the consulting club uh, offers great resources to get you caught up on like, what does it take to actually get a consulting job? Um, and then each of the firms, when they come to campus, I know that's pre-COVID times, but they hold these events now virtually, um, will hold specific events for certain affinity groups um, and uh, really want to get to know you and just come and kind of talk to you and tell you about the firm, uh, tell you what it's like to be, um, to be at the firm specifically for them um, and for those that identify just as, as you do, um, if you do. And so um, those, are, I think, are the, the three kind of really big resources that exist, particularly for consulting um, recruiting. Okay, we have an application question. So how will it be perceived by checking yes to LGBT on your admissions application? Um, will they, will the person, what if what happens if the person gets aligned with a second year interviewer could it hurt them if that person happens to be conservative? I think that's a really good question. And frankly, I don't know that there's a good answer to it. I mean, 
a so I don't know do that do would somebody who's interviewing you even have access to that information Jordan no so I'll, I'll I'm happy to jump in for this um so no the inter the person interviewing you would not have access to that type of information the person who's interviewing you there are interviews are conducted blindly so they only have access to what you put on your resume um so if no identifying information other than your name is on your resume the person interviewing you is only going to understand or have access to your work history maybe your interests, some awards that you've made or the things that you included on your resume. So rest assured, the person interviewing you wouldn't even know that information. Um, and the way it's perceived as on the admissions application is it's not, it's not perceived in any negative way at all. Um, we're welcoming, opening, open to all identities when it comes to applicants um, within our program. So there wouldn't be any adverse impact as far as a person identifying within their application and also the person who gets to interview you would not have access to that information at all. Um, so great question, but there, I'm hoping I was able to alleviate some of those concerns um, because the person just wouldn't have access to, the, to that information because our interviews are conducted blindly. Um, great question though. Uh, we have a question around Black Lives Matter. So um, what's been the response to, Black, to the Black Lives Matter movement by um, SOM, but also the broader Yale community and our students involved and what more can be done by us. I can kick us off potentially. I, um, first, I think that um, obviously, you know, uh, Dean Kerwin Charles made a statement um, directly addressing George Floyd's murder, as well as more broadly, the Black Lives Matter movement um, pretty shortly after the, um, the murder itself. Um, I think I personally believe that he is uh, like a very thoughtful and mm, a good leader, broadly speaking, to be at the head of Yale SOM at this time. Um, I also know that uh, SOM alum wrote a letter um, demanding changes, demanding action from SOM administration um, and, the, and the student body um, to address racial equity and um, injustice at SOM. So there have been a number of conversations between student government, uh, the administration, the alum who wrote the letter, um, and any others who signed the letter to talk about what that means um, with an emphasis on not, not just riding this wave that happened to hit in 2020 and in other years, um, but to really think about sis systematically addressing this in a in a way that addresses it um, over time, right, in perpetuity. Um, and, you know, uh, these are really com hard conversations to have um, naturally. Um, you know, I don't know that anything that the university can do in this year or next year can be ever enough. Um, but I think, again, focusing on the long term uh, outlook. Um, of addressing racial equity in the school, in New Haven, more broadly, um, that's, that's the primary focus. That's the sense that I'm getting. Thank you, Sherry. So a couple of questions just came through about applications more general, generally. Um, can you share some tips or best, your best advice around how a person can approach the application? Um, I would say, and you know, the, I feel like I've talked to a number of prospective students and this is usually followed up by like, what, what is the most important part of the application? Like really, what's the secret? And I think, you know, and this, I feel like people hate this answer, but it's so true. It really is a holistic application. And I think when you think about every component, you have to really take everything seriously when it comes to the actual essays, to who's recommending you, of course, the GMAT, but the GMAT is by no means the end all be all. It really is every facet of your application. And so don't neglect anything just because you think it's of lesser importance. So, you know, really doing the research with the school that 
you want to attend, you know, speaking with individuals to really get that better sense and the personalized experience um, and just really putting in the work in every single piece. And just to build on what David was saying, I would really take this as an opportunity to like let your personality come through and let the things that make you unique come through. And maybe that includes talking about some, you know, volunteer work that you've done on in your essay that's super important to you. Like let the admissions committee know what drives you and like what wait, what gets you out of bed in the morning. And yeah, like David said, it's not, it's not like just your test scores. Um, I think this also touches back on the question of whether or not you should, you know, check the LGBTQ plus box on your application, whether it's for business school or for jobs, whatever, like, yeah, is the world kind of like homophobic, transphobic, racist? Yeah, totally. Um, and are you, you know, sure to meet people along the way who like meet those criteria? Yeah, but um, I think that the most compelling way to tell your story is one that isn't doing too much like self-censorship and that really allows the admissions committee to see the full value that would, um, that you would bring to the school, which goes like what way beyond your Excel skills. Like honestly, nobody really needs your Excel skills here. <laughs> That's so true. I mean, I would just say that take the time to understand, like know your own why. It's also possible that as you go through this process, you might get to the answer for yourself that you're like, maybe right now is not the best time. And that's okay. I think your best application will be when you're honest with yourself and you're saying like, is this for me right now, this place? Then, you know, if the answer is yes, great, then that's probably when you're going to have your best application that you're going to put forward. And be okay with saying no to yourself. So what opportunities do you have to connect with the greater Yale? So other professional schools or just the broader Yale? I'll share a very quick example. I knew when I came here, I wanted to take a law school class because we're all just like, hey, this law school is really good here. Um, and so I thought, you know, maybe I'm going to learn something interesting and different. Um, and so I'm taking a law school class and I'm enjoying it. Lots of reading. Um, I know I'm not going to become a lawyer, but I'm enjoying it. So I think that's one small, very small example. Um, another small example I'll throw out there, um, through groups like social impact consulting or other case competitions that are just released more broadly to um, graduate students and in particular MBAs. Uh, I think that presents an opportunity where you can form a team of others who are interested in whatever case competition you're looking to do. Um, and it's a very, I guess, um, I was gonna say organic, but maybe it's not that organic. You know, it's a nice way to meet other people from different programs. Um, and I will also just say like, maybe this is not true um, more broadly, but my impression is that Yale actually has a lot of dual degree MBA students. So, you know, with the public health school, with the law school, MD, um, school of environment, just really lovely getting to meet those people naturally through class, class work. So do any of you or are there opportunities for the out of office club to connect and engage with the other LGBTQ clubs around campus? There are opportunities. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I think I mentioned like, uh, last year, we you know we had a cross grad mixer and, and that aside, uh, there is a round table that happens. Um, I, I forget how often or, or what the cadence is, but we're just different leaders of just uh, the LGBTQ plus clubs of the different grad schools come together and just talk about um, just a broader community and perhaps any initiatives um, that might happen. But those are just a couple of examples. Yeah, I went to some great um, events last year through the LGBTQ Center at Yale. They have some mixers for grad and professional students um, that are great. And then as a last resort, there's always Tinder. 
nice plug. <laughs> um, so realistically, when it comes to your, your electives, um, how many classes outside of SOM are you able to fit in? As many as, as you can, honestly. So after the first year, the first year is pretty much the core, but even then some people end up placing out of certain courses and then can just take another, they could take elective in, in its place in your second semester of your first year, you can take, um, I think one to three, depending on how many core classes you have. But the second year really is whatever you want. I correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan, but, or, or anyone, but I don't think you're technically required to take any SOM classes in your second year. That's right. It was once, once you satisfy your, your core responsibilities, your, your opportunity at that point is, is like you said, whatever you want it to be. So courses anywhere on campus um, that you're able to get into. And that's a good kind of segue into the next question. Um, so is it difficult to get into electives at, that are at other professional schools? So I can only speak to my limited experience. Also, I do want to say a small, small correction to what you just said, Jordan. So I would say what I recall from last year, take all classes outside of SOM in, in your second year. Um, but, um, but they might wonder like, why are you doing this? Like, what's the, they want to make sure that you are kind of like leaving with a good skill set for the future. They, the, they being our academic affairs team might reach out and be like, tell us what the, what the logic is behind this. So you just might get like an email being like, we want to talk about this. Uh, but technically on paper, you can do that. Um, so I want to be sure everybody knew that. Uh, and then as far as how easy it is, I can only tell you that it was easy for me for the law school class, but um, I mean, you just literally submit interest to the professor. You say, I really want to do this. And chances are the professor is going to say yes. There are some classes I've heard of other people saying that they couldn't get into that are in the Yale, Yale College, um, but I don't know exactly which they were and, and why that was, um, but I don't think that that's super common. I mean, yeah. if there's small seminars, faculty need to prioritize people who are in the department, which would also be the case at SOM. You know, if there are a bunch of SOM students who want to take a class, they're not going to, you know, let a bunch of other people take those seats. I think that if you have a really strong reason for wanting to take a uh, class that you can articulate, then in general, you'll have a better chance. And then for bigger lecture classes, it's just going to be easier in general. So prior to COVID, um, what was the social life like at SOM? What activities were there? What, what types of things that you do on campus, but then also off campus? Not necessarily limited, limited to like what New Haven has to offer, but as a student, what was it, that social life like for you all? What didn't we do? Wow. Um, it was, there was a lot, honestly, and formal, informal, like, I, I think the stereotype of, of really having to manage your time really comes comes true um, pre-COVID at least just because there are multiple things going on at the same time and it really becomes a choice of what do I want to go to? Um, you know, it can be anything from a club event where it's just a pure social. It can be something to a conference like the education conference or the healthcare conference or the cannabis conference um, that happened last year um, to like a speaker series that happened um, you know, informally socials, there are just different uh, like house parties that happened pre-COVID, um, a lot of bars downtown that people come together. We have our graduate pub called Griffin, where which is another actually great way for people to meet from different uh, grad schools. It's just a, it's a pub, if you will, which is uh, that's for meant for graduate students that people come together, really cheap drinks. You get together. There are different events. We had our Halloween party last year, there was like face painting, there was like salsa nights, queer nights. So there was a lot going on pre gofid So is anybody a part of other clubs outside of out of office? And what does that balance look like for you as being members of multiple clubs? I think you can really, I mean, being involved in a club isn't like a binary on off thing. You can show up to an event. Like I've gone to a couple design and innovation club events that were really great, but I'm not constantly going to all the meetings. I'm one of the leaders for out of office. So I've made a commitment to doing that. Um, I've also been involved in the marketing club and 
use some of those, you know, took advantage of some of those resources during recruiting my first year. I took part in a, a marketing case prep team, and that was really useful for me. And so I decided this year that I wanted that I wanted to give that give back and lead one of those teams for the first years. But all of those were decisions, individual decisions that I made along the way. They weren't automatic in being involved with the club. So yeah, I've been involved in a ton of clubs and gone to a ton of events because you can always go on campus groups and see what's going on that week um, and see what kinds of, you know, what you're interested in checking out. You know, maybe the energy club has a really cool speaker that you want to attend, but it doesn't mean that you're like bound to the energy club. Yeah, plus one that I think um, some of the clubs are really great because they let you know in advance, or most clubs not let you know in advance, you know, hey, this is the data analytics club, we are going to do uh, sequel part one, part two, part three on these dates, put in your calendar, um, you know, and uh, it's very similar for design and innovation and other other clubs as well. So you, you, you can get a good sense of how to build your schedule. Um, and I like vaguely missed the question, but I will just say, um, you know, in COVID now, because everything's virtual, recruiting, class, office hours, review sessions, club meetings, like you're, you actually have a very low barrier to attending all of these things. So before, you know, um, before every day, I'll look at what I put in my calendar and then start making decisions about, okay, this is what I want to do today versus not. Um, and having a hypothesis for how you want to be spending your time before things start to ramp up is a really great way to just gut check yourself in the moment. Hey, you know, I thought that I really wanted to bolster consulting skills or consulting practice. Looking at my calendar now, like, am I really doing that? Or, hey, I really wanted to prioritize meal prepping, you know, and not eating out all the time. Um, or, I wanted to prioritize meeting new people every week. Am I actually doing that? So thinking through that, you know, on a week to week basis, on a month to month basis can really help you like reevaluate. Okay, am I really doing what I wanted to do? If not, that's okay, why not? Um, and, and just doing that reflection. So we had an earlier question that I wanted to ask as well. Um, so is the S1 community what you imagined it would be prior to coming? And now when, since you're here, um, does the, do those two things align at all? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll say, yeah. I mean, I mentioned before, I thought the community was one that appeared very supportive and one where people uplifted each other and just truly um, placed a value on establishing meaningful friendships and connections and bonds with individuals. And I think that's been ex extremely true. And, you know, if there was ever a trial to really put, you know, these uh, friendships to the test and these connections, it was going through COVID together. And I think I've come out of this with stronger connections than ever before. You know, Jerry mentioned uh, amazing adventures responsibly so over the summer. And even a lot of events I've had with, with Martha as well, I think, that you know, going through this together really brought us as a community stronger and more connected. And I'm I'm excited to see how things are going to happen even more so with a with a new class. Um, Sherry is actually a new first year leader, so excited to see how she brings this, um, how she brings her community and her ideas to the table. So I'm very excited. I think I'll say one thing that was surprising to me about um, the way our community played out uh, here at SOM is now that I'm a second year, I didn't like you just form really tight bonds with the people in your class. It's just how it is. Um, and I was just, I'm very surprised at like how many first years I'm getting to know um, and, you know, forming some friendships with early on, like really quickly. That was surprising to me. Um, and a really good surprise, I'd say. I definitely feel, I think I mentioned this earlier, but um, the out of office folks are the, the, the first kind of like warm beacon type home type community for me um, in this first month and couple days of, of being at SOM. And so, you know, I, I, that was, 
uh, not necessarily like a very strong expectation, but I definitely had very positive um, associations with the, the out of office community just from attending panels like this or talking to people throughout the admissions process. And so I'm very happy to say that, you know, the, the community formed here has met slash exceeded my expectations. Um, like for example, uh, the night when the news about RBG's death came, I was with out of office people and we just had a really like powerful moment together to kind of take in the news and somebody brought a guitar and just, you know, started playing guitar and singing songs. And that was so, so, so cathartic. Um, I think for me and everybody who was there. So things like that, things that are unexpected um, moments, um, I think are really valuable. So what's something that each of you wish you had known prior to joining SOM? I wish that I had known the degree to which I have and like needed to take agency and responsibility in choosing what I prioritized. Um, I think as somebody who has always been sort of like a, a little like study nerd, it was hard for me to adjust to an academic space where I needed to also prioritize other things um, and sometimes prioritize them over academics. Um, and I wish that I had known that <laughs> I needed to manage my level of engagement with all these things. Like you can't do everything at once. You can't do all the academics and all the recruiting and all the social club stuff. Like you just cannot do it all. And so you need to figure out what is gonna bring value to you, what's going to like bring you joy, what's going to get you closer to your goals and prioritize those things and build in time to like stare at the wall and watch Netflix and like, I don't know, sit on like lay in the grass with your friend. Yeah, I echo that and maybe like even taking kind of like a step back even before that related to something Jerry said was, you know, really sitting down before this journey, reflecting on what you need and what you want, and really thinking about that why. Because I think once you get to campus, it really is, it's like you're on a treadmill and some full speed and you're not getting off until the, the year is over, but even then you're on your, then you're in your internship. So anyway, so you really just want to make sure that before you set foot on campus, like you are very intentional. And I thought I, I thought I did. I thought I did reflect deeply, but you know, you then become aware of so many other things, which is natural too, right? Not to say that I felt like I went off course, but really like trying to be as thoughtful as you can, um, just to make sure that you really are maximizing and make them making the most out of this experience. And not and I feel like knowing all that will alleviate the pressure of being pulled from a thousand different directions, because you'll just have a you'll have more clarity in what it is that you actually want to do. plus one those those comments and I maybe say something different um for me um I had worked in teams in the past but teams that, where you have very defined roles for example at work um or in sports teams where you also you know there's leadership and things like that coming into SOM and um working in teams uh without having those distinct roles, without having like expect, you know, common expectations or necessarily um, verbalized, confirmed like um, goals and objectives was actually a very, very, very interesting experience for me. Um, and I think normal in, in non-COVID times, um, SOM has a, a small, form course that's called managing groups and teams at the very beginning of the semester. We are having it um, in a couple of weeks. So that could be lending some of that to some of, lending itself to some of my experience. Um, but either way, I think it was a very, very 
very interesting thing. You know, why, why am I getting frustrated? Why am I getting upset? Or like, why, you know, what makes me excited about this working in this team? Those are all things that I was kind of grappling with. Um, and I think I've learned a lot, even in the short amount of time that I've spent uh, working on teams. So that would be, that would have been something that maybe I wasn't expecting to get to learn so quickly. And so um, viscerally, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you wanted me to go as well, Jordan. I can go quickly if you need it. Um, sure. Uh, a lot of people go down the route of consulting at our school, it's just a fact. And so I'll just share something about consulting that I know a number of people would not agree with, but it was my own experience. And that is, um, I used to be a study nerd back in the day um, and coming here and realizing that like, I had to sacrifice, at least for me, a lot of my academics early on so that I could prepare for consulting. Didn't sit right with, sit right with me. But I wish I had known more things I could do. If I knew consulting was the path I wanted to take, what are the things I could do by myself before I got to SOM such that I could like make the most of my academics and other experience? Perfect. Thank you all so much. I think it's a good time for us to end on that note. Um, I want to thank Jerry, Martha, David, and Sherry for your insight and partnership with us at the Community Inclusion Department, but then also just Yell in general. Um, you're all gems in the space, and I appreciate you all um, individually with the con contributions that you have. Um, to everyone who participated in the webinar, thank you also for joining us. Um, feel free to stay connected with us. Um, you can always reach out to us at MBA dot admissions at yale.edu or reaching out to us individually. We're happy to, to connect with you and happy to support your journey to, to MBA. Um, so on that note, thank you all and have a good rest of the day.